Welcome. I've been asked to give a little spiel about hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. But in order to get going on that, I need to first talk about ordinary sine and ordinary cosine. These are called the circular functions. Um, why is that? Because they actually relate to circles. Now, mathematicians don't like to make hard work for themselves. They're going to work with the simplest circle they can think of, namely a circle centered at the origin. Whoops, there's my axes. Here it is. That seems fine. And the simplest radius to choose would be 1. All right. So this is an equation of the form x squared plus y squared equals 1. Circle centered at the origin, radius 1. Now, what I could do with this circle is simply look at different points on it. And if you look at my trigonometry videos, this is actually the start of trigonometry. They thought stars went in circular motion, rising in the east, going overhead and heading down the west. Assume it's a circular motion. And all you can do is look up at a star at a different angles of elevation. Theta. Well, of course, you might be interested in how high is that star. So people call that height sine of theta. You might be interested in how far over is that star. And people call that overness cosine of theta. Well, of course, cosine of theta is just the x coordinate at this point. Sine of theta is just the y coordinate at this point. So really, sine and cosine are just literally the two basic features of points on a circle. What's the x and y coordinates when I'm looking at different angles of elevation theta? And since it is following the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, these points must satisfy x coordinate squared, cosine squared, plus y coordinate squared, sine squared theta must be 1. So there it is. These are, called, these are the circular functions. They are just parametrizing points on the circle at different angles theta, and therefore they satisfy the basic equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, of course, you can play this game with different shapes. If you look at my video on squine and cosquine, you can actually parametrize a square this way and, and just call those the square functions, if you like, squine and cosquine, and hours of fun to be had. But then in this playing this game, it seems natural to play with the equation x squared minus y squared equals 1 and see if we can just mute, mutate a little bit. And people might think, well, let's look at x squared minus y squared equals 1. And one learns in, in some algebra class in high school, it's a very classic shape, it's called hyperbola. It goes through the point positive 1 on the x-axis and makes a u-shape on the right. It goes through also the point negative 1 on the x-axis and makes a matching u-shape on the left. And in fact, um, these u-shapes don't grow, they're sort of bounded by a pair of diagonal lines, y equals x and y equals negative x. So these are diagonal lines at, at 45 degrees. And we can play the same game. We can just choose different points on um, this uh, hyperbola, and we can just maybe call the height of this, the hyperbolic sine of it, the overness of this point, the uh, hyperbolic cosine. The trouble is, I don't know if I'm really talking about angles of elevation anymore. I'm a little leery to do that because obviously I can do angles from zero up to about 45 degrees, but then I've got this little weird don't go region. And I don't want to talk about angles between 45 degrees and 135 degrees, but then I can start talking about angles again from 135 degrees onwards. So it seems odd to parameterize in terms of this angle anymore. So we'll let go of this idea of looking at angles of elevation. So now we're forced, can we work out a way to parameterize that has come up with some functions x and y that fit this formula um, so that we can actually talk about points on a circle. And we might call these the hyperbolic sine, the hyperbolic cosine. All right, well, it turns out there's lots of different ways you can come up with formulas of x and y that fit this equation. And I'm going to come up with three of them right now. Um, they're going to come out of thin air. This is obviously for people just playing over decades and decades of different ideas. So there's no reason you'd think of these formulas. You might, well, actually, you might think of this is the one I'm about to do. I'll take the classic formula, cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. Divide everything through by cosine squared. So cosine squared divided by cosine squared is 1 plus sine squared divided by cosine squared, well sine over cos is tan, so that's tan squared. Theta is 1 over si cosine squared, but 1 over cosine is called secant, so that'd be secant squared theta. And if I rearrange this a bit, I get secant squared theta minus tan squared theta equals 1. So if I let x be secant of theta and y be tangent of theta, they will indeed, for each different value of theta, give me a point on this hyperbola. Now watch out, just because I'm using theta doesn't mean it's matching the angle I'm talking about anymore, because I can put in theta equals 80 degrees in this formula, even though there's no 80 degrees here. So I'm somehow, somehow mutating what I mean by angle in this, this model. Um, actually, you've got to be careful. We can't put, let me, this is really 1 over cosine of theta, and this is really sine theta over cosine of theta. So we can't put in angles where cosine is 0, namely 90 degrees is bad. Um, in fact, you'll notice that if I choose an angle between negative 90 and 90, that's the region where cosine is positive. So this term here, the x coordinate will be positive, which means it must be only on the branch of this hyperbola where the x is positive. So between 90 degrees and negative 90 degrees, I must be getting points on this right-hand branch. When x goes from 90 degrees up to um, uh, 270 degrees, Oh, oops, 2, <laughs> 3 pi over 2. Um, this is where cosine is negative, in which case the x coordinate is going to be negative, so that must give me the region of points over here on this branch. 
Anyhow, anyhow. I could do that, but that seems kind of strange and a little bit unnatural. Um, that's one possible parameterization. It doesn't feel right. Uh, another possible parameterization, and this one's just going to come completely out of the blue. People noticed after a while, in fact, if you study the circle function, you should do this as a circle. But if I set x equals 1 minus t squared, oh, sorry, um, 1 plus t squared over 1 minus t squared. Sorry, my brain's just going to be a little wacky there. And 2t over 1 minus t squared. Just sheer algebra, crunching it through, shows that x squared minus y squared equals 1. So again, each value of t, whatever t means in this model, will give you different points on this hyperbola. In fact, if you look at my uh, values of t, I could get negative x values. You can tell you which branch you're on. By the way, this shows you that this hyperbola goes through infinitely many rational points. To choose a rational number, and there you are, I've got a point, rational points x and y that are on this hyperbola. All right, and then here comes a third one, completely out of the blue. And, it's, and I can tell you, actually, this one's not bizarrely out of the blue, because it has some motivation behind it. Take x to be e to the t plus e to the negative t divided by 2, and take y to be e to the t minus e to the negative t, all divided by 2. And if you just grind through the algebra, square the x value, subtract squared the y value, it does all simplify and become 1. This has become the preferred definition for hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. That if I've got a point for each value t, I get some point on the curve. People like to call the height of this point the hyperbolic sine. And instead of writing h sine, they call it sine h and pronounce it cinch. So this will be the cinch of t. And instead of calling this the hyperbolic cosine, they like to call it the cosine with an h after it, and they call it the cosh of t. So for different values of t, not quite sure what t means, they're not referring to angle anymore, we'll let go of the whole angle idea. But for different values of t, we get a point on the hyperbola whose height is called the cinch and whose overness is called the cosh. Now, why on earth would mathematicians say this is the one to go with for defining and for matching hyperbolic sine and, hyperbolic, and for matching sine and cosine? Well, it's Euler. Euler discovered, and we have to go to another one of these videos, this is getting a complicated video, that the trigonometry is vastly improved if you th allow yourself to have complex numbers. He knows that e to the i x turns out to be cosine of x plus i sine of x. So I put an e to the i negative x, and e to the negative i x would be the cosine of negative x, oops, plus i sine of negative x. Well, of course, cosine of negative x is the same as ordinary cosine of x, and sine of negative x is negative sine, so negative i sine of x. Okay, so I've got two formulas. e to the i x is cos x plus i sine x. e to the i negative x is cos x minus i sine x. Add the two together, the whole i stuff cancels. I get two cos x's. So cos x would be the sum of these two things, e to the i x plus e to the minus i x, all divided by 2. And if I subtract the first formula and subtract the second formula, I'd get um, i sine x minus minus i sine x. So I get 2i sine x. So sine x all by itself would be e to the i x minus e to the minus i x all over 2. So people noticed that with complex numbers, the ordinary circular functions satisfy these formulas. This is why if I get rid of the i's, we have basically got these formulas that I've phrased in terms of t over here. So people feel like these purple formulas are the natural counterpart to the circular functions. So they define cosh of x to be e to the x plus e to the minus x all over 2, and the cinch of x to be e to the x minus e to the minus x all over 2. That's it. And these are indeed formulas that satisfy cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1, the formulas of hyperbola. Whoa, so this is where hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine come from. That's it. These seem to be the correct parameterizations of a hyperbola to match what's going on for the ordinary circular functions. It's amazing that E comes into play. Well, when you do high level mathematics, you get less and less surprised that E keeps appearing, though it is deeply, wonderfully mysterious. All right, all right. So, so there's some fun stuff to do. You can actually prove all sorts of various trig identities and so forth, or hyperbolic trig identities. For example, it's just a pure algebra game, just grind through the algebra with all these E's everywhere, that cosh of x plus y 
turns out to be cosh x cosh y plus cinch x cinch y. And the double the addition formula for cinch turns out to be um, what was it a cinch x cosh y plus cosh x cinch of y. Now I'm going to point this out because there's something really wonderfully mysterious going on here. The double angle for the summation formula for ordinary cosine cosine of x plus y is cos x cos y minus sine x sine y and sine of x plus y equals sine x cos y plus um, cos x sine y. So there's this very strange interplay going on that you remember cosine and sine had i's inserted in them and cinch and cosh are the same formulas where the i's taken out. And if you look at this formula, the ordinary trigonometric formula compared to the hyperbolic formulas, they look very similar. And you can play with other formulas. I, I won't go through them all here. Get the triple angle formulas, the double angle formulas, blah, 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 blah. But here's my challenge for you. Does it make sense that if I just take an ordinary trigonometry identity that I'm familiar with, and whenever I see a sign, put an I with it. So there's a sign there, so I put an I there, I'll put an I there. And that's it. And then once you put the I's in, make all the cos cosines koshes and and all the sines sunches, and what we have, I'll have cosh of x plus y equals cosh x cosh y minus i squared, minus i squared is plus cinch x cinch y, which is this formula. Or if I do the same thing in my very messy handwriting, people are going to complain at me now. Here's the ordinary sine x plus y equals sine x cos y plus cos x sine y. Whenever I see a sign, put an i with it, put an i with it, put an i with it, and now rewrite it, rewrite all the signs of cinches and the cosines of coshes, I would get that i cinch of x plus y equals i, oop, cinch, oh, sorry, pen, x, Okay, I have bad handwriting, but I also have bad software here, plus um, i cosh y, cos actually cinch y, and I can cancel out the i's, and voila, it's this formula. So I'm wondering if any formula, the trig identity that's true in ordinary trigonometry, if I do this trick, whenever I see a sign, make it i sign, and then call all the sine cinches and all the cosines coshes, are they always guaranteed to be true hyperbolic trig identities? Mystery, think about it. Something about that eye. Something about that eye going on. All right, lots of fun. Hope this helps a little bit to explain where cosh and cinch come from. Oh, by the way, I should mention. Oh, oh, oh. Of course, Galileo. Where's my pen gone? Um, Galileo wondered. Cancel. Sorry. If, you're, if I look at a, a, a like a power line, his two poles, a hanging chain or rope between two poles or two power lines, something seems to make a U-shaped curve. And this U-shaped curve, Galileo wondered if it was a parabola. Turns out it's not a parabola. It's basically this cosh curve. So actually these hyperbolic signs and cosines appear in all sorts of places in nature. All right, that's my final thought. Thanks so much, everyone.